Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of November 2nd, 2017. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight, and I will be presiding tonight. Um, we will start off, as we start off every meeting, with um, public comment, which is your opportunity to speak truth to power, as it were. You may speak to us um, with some limitations, and the limitations aren't grand limitations. They're just thoughtful limitations. And um, we ask that you keep your comments and remarks under three minutes, and you don't have to go the whole three minutes, just a hint. Um, the uh, you are not limited by topic you can speak on any point it doesn't have to be on the agenda it doesn't even have to be specific to Northampton you also don't have to be from Northampton you are a citizen there you are a citizen in, of this community and by virtue of being here and they're thereby qualified we ask when you step up to please identify yourself say your name and your address for the public record and um, we also ask that you understand that the council, because this is your time to speak, will not be responding. So please don't direct questions as because we're actually precluded by our rules from responding to your questions. They'll, so they'll stand as rhetorical questions. Um, it doesn't mean we aren't prepared to discuss them with you outside of the meeting, but as it is not, they're not items that are on the agenda, we're actually precluded by law, uh, state law from dis deliberating them. So. The other thing I would ask you is to consider, and I don't think that's actually going to happen tonight, but in, in some instance you may, you may heap criticism on people and things. We qualify for your criticism by name. Be it we're elected officials, we're there by public officials, and we actually are, cannot be defamed. But I ask you to refrain from calling out your neighbor by name, for instance, because they are not a public figure. If there's someone who bothers you or disturbs you, you can mention them by pronoun or acknowledge their humanness, but you cannot mention their name. That would, I would appreciate that. All right, with all those caveats, here we go. And we've got a long list. Uh, first up, uh, William Donnelly, please. Thank you. Uh, can you speak at the podium? Yeah. Yes, please, yeah. And the microphone will pick you up, so you don't need to make an adjustment. Thank you very much. Um, um, good evening, Honorable President Bill Dwight, uh, Honorable Counselors, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Bill Donnelly. I live in 32 Woods Road here on the west side of the city. Uh, I've been living there 23 years since the house was built. And I'm here tonight just to call your attention to the condition, the unsafe condition of First Pit Road heading west out of the town. Um, for many years, it's been patched and repatched. And uh, potholes, potholes have been filled and refilled, and um, so I have a petition of, for myself and 150 of my neighbors here, uh, that we've been working on. I, I believe the mayor is aware of the petition upcoming. Um, uh, Council of the Bars has worked tirelessly, tirelessly with me over a number of months to put this together and to bring it forward. Um, at any rate, let me read the p petition, if I may. Sure. Uh, the present condition of Burst Pit Road from its intersection at the four-way stop at Florence Road westward to Cardinal Way and beyond is cause for grave concern. This highly traveled thoroughfare is daily used for the transport of school children, hundreds of citizens going to and from work, the transport of the elderly, and with lack of sidewalks, those pedestrians who are forced to walk on the street to visit neighbors, walk their dogs, ride their bicycles, etc. There is risk of imminent danger. Because this road already has characteristics such as blind curves situated on hills and valleys as well as a surface riddled with potholes and disintegrating patches, motorists are constantly swerving from lane to lane even in good weather. Now Burspit Road is a single lane going each way uh, and it has double yellow lines, solid lines. So in order to avoid these potholes, one has to actually violate the rules of the road to go around the potholes coming into the oncoming traffic, uh, an indication of the risk. Um, during snow or rainfall, these hidden potholes have caused major damage to both tires, rims, and suspensions of many passing vehicles, and the resulting loss of control of these vehicles impairs the safety of said vehicles and those who must use the road as a pedestrian walkway. Burst Pit Road, having suffered for a decade or more from lack of proper road care and maintenance, is now an extremely high danger zone and constitutes a great risk for tragedy. The question is not if this tra tragedy will occur, but when. Please know that our concern is for all our citizens. The city of Northampton has proudly spent a great deal of money on public projects, and those efforts are much appreciated. 
but the lives and safety of those who walk or drive on Burst Pit Road is most clearly in jeopardy, and this should be an immediate priority for the city and for the Department of Public Works. A further delay of, of five more years is unacceptable. We only at, are asking for what is reasonable and correct. Your immediate uh, attention to a most dangerous and correctable problem is required. Parks, trees, grass, and roads can be replaced. Lives cannot. Uh, one more little added comment is that when, I, when we get talking with neighbors, we say, what do you think of Burst Pit Road? And the neighbors say, well, we don't use Bur Burst Pit Road anymore. We, we do the go around. So the alternative to Burst Pit Road is on the west, west side is Ryan Road. Is Ryan Road and to go down Ryan Road interferes with the school traffic for the elementary school. The other alternative is to go Cardinal Way and cross over to Route 66. And Cardinal Way is kind of a um, modest development with all 45 children live there, I believe. And the the residents there are concerned about the traffic cutting through at a re regular road speed. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Appreciate your attention. Thank you. Good night. Uh, John Berkowitz, I saw you. There you are. John Berkowitz, 65 Franklin Street, Northampton, a coordinator of the group Pioneer Valley Death with Dignity Action Group. Uh, we were here with the resolution uh, calling on the legislature if the Northampton City Council would pass it, and they did, you did, 9 to 0 two weeks ago. This is the second reading. I appreciate all the input you took last time. And I just want to add a couple of points, uh, particularly around the issue of how would this affect people with disabilities. Uh, first of all, I would say, that I have lifelong friends with disabilities, and I would not support this bill if it didn't have strong safeguards that protect them, as well as frail elders, low-income people, and others from potential coercion or abuse. I would also point out one of the co-sponsors in the state legislature is Senator Barbara Letalien, who has a son with severe aut autism. And she wouldn't be a lead sponsor of a bill like this if she didn't think it had adequate safeguards too, and she has testified to that. I also want to point out that our representative, Peter Kokot, state representative Peter Kokot, signed on this spring as a co-sponsor of the legislation in the State House after we met with him. But that was only after he had satisfied his concerns about whether there was, were adequate safeguards built into this bill. I also want to say that on September 21st, uh, there was a press conference before a major public hearing before the State House, the legislature, the Public Health Committee of the legislature. And a man named Michael Martinetti from Lexington, who had been diagnosed, has been diagnosed with Friedrich's ataxia, which is a life shortening progressive neuromuscular disease, he said, I know that people like me won't be forced to use medical aid in dying because that just isn't how the law works and not what it's for. The law specifies that a person can't qualify for medical aid in dying simply because they have a disability. Not everyone seems to understand this critical requirement. I also want to point out that the Disability Rights Legal Center, which has a long and successful track record of litigating on behalf of disabled Americans, is an active supporter of medical aid in dying. This is nationally, not in just in Massachusetts. It is declared that, quote, it poses no threat to people with dis disabilities. Medical aid in dying has a proven safety record. There has been annual public health department oversight evaluation of the implementation of the laws over the last 20 years in Oregon, 10 in Washington, five in Montana, three in Vermont, one in California and Colorado. There have been no documented cases of abuse or coercion. I'd also say that an organization called Disability Rights Oregon has never received a complaint of abuse or attempted abuse under the Death with Dignity Act in that state for the last 20 years. Lastly, in your handouts, I call your attention to Andrew Batavia's book published last year, co-written with his brother Mitchell. The quote is, the, the book is called Wisdom from a Chair, 30 Years of Quadriplegia. He said, my mission in this world is to try to ensure that all people, including people with disabilities, have greater choices in and control over their lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Peg Rasmussen, please. Good evening. My name is Margaret Rasmussen, or Peg Rasmussen. I live at 68 Golden Chain Lane in Northampton. 
This is a, a place called Lathrop, which is a Kendall affiliate. And it is chock full of seniors who live independently in their own homes. We often discuss topics like healthy living, keeping fit, meaningful lives, and approaching deadlines. <coughs> For me, at four score and four more, that includes planning for a few more road scholar trips, as well as the trip that Dylan Thomas called into that good night. The end of life option act that we contemplate this evening should assuage the fears of many seniors throughout the Commonwealth, both now and in the future. Whether or not a patient ever requests access to its provisions, it holds a very real comfort for those who do encounter terminal illnesses, and also for the majority who never will, but who fear that they might. This is a bill with safeguards that will have a lasting value in Massachusetts, and I urge its approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Sigrid. Oh, boy, Sigrid, you're going to tell me your last name. I'm Sigrid <coughs> Schmaltzer. Sigrid okay. Schmaltzer. Um, I live at 102 William Street. Um, this is the first time I'm telling this story publicly. Um, in January 2015, I helped my father die. For several years, he had been suffering from an apparently undiagnosable and untreatable illness. By the end, he was living a very literal nightmare. He was unable to sleep, unbearably uncomfortable when lying or sitting down, but also increasingly unable to walk. And he was experiencing profound bouts of terror, especially at night. The doctors were very clear that there was nothing they could do, but they could not say when his torment might be over. It could be months, maybe even years. There was really no telling. So finally, he asked my mother to help him end his life, but she was not up to that task, so it fell to me. I looked for any information I could find. I was scared that some of what I was looking for might not be legal, so I switched to a search engine that doesn't track you. And I ended up presenting my dad with these options. We could try to get him on a plane to Switzerland, but he was in no shape to be in an airplane for that long. Even half an hour sitting still was misery for him. We could move to Vermont and wait six months to establish residency, but that was much too long for him. He needed it to be over really quickly. Um, it was bitterly cold out that January, so I thought maybe we could give him a bottle of whiskey and help walk him out into the field and stay with him until he froze to death. But this was totally terrifying to him, so we scratched that one. And the only other option I could find um, was actually from our very own Hampshire Gazette, um, where Lori Lysel had covered the story of Lee Hawkins, who had voluntarily stopped eating and drinking. And I will be forever, forever grateful for that coverage because it gave my father one option that he could actually face. We had the help of some really beautiful hospice workers who understood everything there was to understand about this and were totally supportive. So he was able to stay home while he died. At least once in the process, he did ask my mother for water. Um, but she told him she told him she could give him the water, but it would make it the whole thing take longer. And so he decided to carry on without it. He managed to get out in six days, which I gather was pretty fast. It can take much longer than that. Um, given the alternative of continuing to live that literal nightmare, um, not knowing when it might end, six days really seemed like a gift. But compared to what I was able to give my sick cat just a few months before, it was obviously in horribly cruel. The best option my father had was to die of thirst over six days. And we have no idea how he experienced that time or what kind of hallucinations he might have been seeing. During the first few days when he was still mostly conscious, he thrashed around a lot. Um, it was unbearable for him to lie still, but he was unable to walk even with assistance. I often worry that he may have experienced those six days as an eternity. So I'm asking you to help give other people a better choice than he had. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Marie Frank, please. Hello, Marie Frank, 37 Chapel Street, Northampton. While giving serious thought to the End of Life Options Act, or H1194, that the Massachusetts legislature is currently considering, 
The image of my cousin Francine in her struggle with terminal ovarian cancer frequently revisits me. It was clear that she was at peace with death itself, but she agonized over the debilitating symptoms that could not be controlled with medication and the seemingly endless process of dying. I thought of her and others I have known with similar stories when I read this quotation from the Death with Dignity National Center. <coughs> Death with dig dignity means dying whole. It's passing away as the person you were, not dying without the abilities and functions that make you human. This is one reason why I am fully in support of the passage of H. 1194. Oregon has demonstrated 20 years of success with their bill, and it is interesting to note that at least 11 <coughs> other state legislatures have introduced similar bills in 2017 that have some promise of passage. It is time to open ourselves to new possibilities. I'm also hopeful that if this bill passes, dying patients who are facing possible prolonged and difficult deaths will know that they can open up more authentic, honest, and meaningful dialogues with their families and their doctors as to what they would wish for themselves. Communication and decision-making is often a trying ordeal for families in such circumstances. If we can respect the autonomy of the individual, that is a step in the right direction. I'm calling on the members of the council to please pass the resolution again making it official on your second and final vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Francis Crow. I'm Frances Crow, 3 Langworthy Road, Northampton. I've lived in Northampton since 1951. I'm here to speak of the importance of this body of people in Northampton taking a stand on the military uh, budget and the possibility of developing new <coughs> nuclear weapons that would mortgage our future. I think the money should be better spent making this a sustainable community, repairing our infrastructure, educating our children through college, as most of the rest of the world does, and having free health care for all, instead of spending money for a possible threatening a new nuclear weapon. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Reverend Caicos, you're next when you get a chance. On your time. <laughs> If I reach 98 years old, I'll be able to be as visionary as the person who just spoke, Francis Crowe. <laughs> that was my time, wasn't it? <laughs> um, thank you for, for uh, uh, hearing me speak tonight about the resolution for peace and against militarism. I want to... Uh, First of all, thank you as a council for the great work that you do. Uh, many times I'm sure it's a, th a thankless job, but I thank you in general and in particular for the great efforts you expend in making sure that our tax dollars are used as widely, as wisely and compassionately as possible for the good of all. And that's what this resolution is directed toward, our tax dollars. In 1960, President uh, Dwight Eisenhower was, gave a farewell address, and it was <coughs> prophetic. He said, one, 
beware of the military industrial complex. And he said, two, realize that every dollar that is spent for the military is a dollar taken away for human services, for infrastructure, <coughs> for our environment. Case in point, in 2003, the Army Corps of Engineers came to Congress and said, we need to shore up the levees in New Orleans so that they can withstand an impact of a Category 5 hurricane. We know it's coming. The 2003 folks. Congress said we can't do that because we have invaded Iraq and the money that we spend on that invasion will not allow us to give you the 200 million that you need to shore up the levees to Category 5. So they gave them 10 percent, folks, 20 million. Two years later, can you say it with me together? Hurricane Katrina. Nearly 2,000 lives either lo <coughs> lost that day or lost as a result. Hundreds of thousands without homes, all because we decided to invade a nation that had absolutely, and it's been, it's been confirmed, absolutely no ties to Al-Qaeda back in 2003. Folks, that's not only wasteful, it is immoral and criminal. I urge you to unanimously and wholeheartedly support this resolution for peace and against militarism. Thank you. And I have three more seconds. Take them. Bless you and keep you. <laughs> Spot on. Thank you very much. Uh, Norma Namatsu. Is it Namatsu? Is Norma here? You're going to read for her? She was not able to be here. May I read her statement? You may. Norma Akamatsu. Akamatsu. I n actually know that. One I'm sorry, I couldn't read your handwriting, John. It's <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> on May 28, the New York Times featured an unusually long article on the death of a 78-year-old Canadian, John Shields. He was in the throes of a terminal, painful, and debilitating illness. This account strengthened my support for the End of Life Options Act, the bill in the Ma Massachusetts legislature. And also last spring, I was grateful that our state representative, Peter Cocott, decided to sponsor this bill, allowing those suffering terminal illness and in sound mind to decide when to die. Shields enrolled in Catholic seminary but left the clergy, disagreeing with church opposition to birth control. He went on to do social work, became a union representative and advocate for environmental issues. His religious background was important to me as I have wrestled with the question of whether we, mere mortals, can decide matters of life and death. Although he abandoned the formal Catholicism of his youth, Shields maintained an evolving spiritual perspective. In his final hours, he asked <coughs> to have the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi read, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Mr. Shields decided at what point to let go of life. He enjoyed a, quote, living wake with friends and family and a, quote, last supper of his childhood comfort food, chicken with gravy. Having organized a gathering for my terminally ill husband, I know the richness and reward for both the dying and their close <coughs> circle of participating in a living eulogy for those we love before they pass on. As a clinical social worker, I have sat with the terminally ill and with frail elders I fully appreciate the comfort that choice over when to die could provide for those confronting the end of life and for their families. I ask the Northampton City Council to pass this resolution, which urges the legislature to pass the End of Life Options Act. We'll all get there someday. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Chris Palms. We're, we're making uh, Council Share our AV, uh, our, our, our AV geek. It should pick you up too, Chris. If you yep. speak towards the mic, it'll pick you up. Yep. 
Yeah, let me speak a little bit towards Francis Crow, one of, one of my heroes. I wanted to say first in support of the opposition to the cameras and militarism, I've lived long enough to remember the sanctuary movement in Cambridge when uh, war resistors uh, in the Friends Meeting House in Cambridge, dear friend of Francis's, John Bach, um, I got arrested with him and was an intimidated by a prosecutor with a picture from a covert camera. So enough of the militarism and forget about unintended consequences of surveillance. Um, the best thing on my other point, which is in the lonely voice of opposition to this um, assisted suicide provision, is just to say, first of all, there have been some very good conversations that have been opened up. Um, with a number of you and others who've spoken um, on behalf of this critical concern. I say again, if you can't live your late life with dignity, you cannot die with dignity. Um, I could have doctors here who would say they have not been able to get wound care from mass health as a result of which horrific wounds have opened up on the, the buttocks and butt end of people with disabilities in the Commonwealth. They have been unable to get pressure relieving beds. They've been unable to get the basic conditions that allow a person to possibly recover because we have fought for medical care for people at times that has been denied. There are false diagnoses after which people who I know have lived extended periods of time having come through their suicidal depression with a diagnosis that would support it. It is simply more complicated. My bottom line is I know which way you all are going to vote from my conversations with you. I respect your vote. I respect those supporting this provision. Um, in the Tibetan tradition, in horror of death, I took to the mountain. Again and again, I meditated on the uncertainty in the hour of death. We all face that. We are looking for dignity in life and in death, and that is a long-term struggle. And it certainly should not come that unexpected moment in the form of death raining from the skies in the name of the greatest democracy on earth. Kristen, can I uh, thank you so much? And can I ask you to just, for the record, state your address? Oh, 659 Park Hill Road, where the improvements on the road let me come to council. <laughs> <laughs> and That's so, very impressive. You combine virtually every topic <laughs> in one statement. That's, that's excellent. Uh, Katie. I'll have to switch this to Amy. Okay. So, you, Katie, do you want to speak at all at some point? Okay. All right. Amy, then. Amy Bookbinder, Grove Avenue in Leeds. And I, I want to support what people have said for the other two resolutions. I'm here to speak about the surveillance resolution. <clears throat> and in case anybody misses my point, I wore my heart, well, not on my sleeve, but on the front of my shirt. Um, I want to address what I believe is a misperception about the important discussion we've been having about the surveillance plan put forth by the police department. Some of you on the council have heard me speak in the past about actions undertaken by our police. When I called for an outside impartial investigation of police actions in the Jonas Korea case, some of you new to the council <coughs> have had that esteemed pleasure. So I will repeat what I said then that makes the point that I want to make again tonight. Good police actions deserve our praise, and I've given it directly and indirectly. Bad police policy requires our criticism. All in our city, including our police, benefit from critical thinking and a willingness to engage in policy discussions. This improves community police relations and keeps us all safe. In that spirit, it's important to correct the misperception that our discussion and the resolution before you tonight is a referendum on the police. It is not. 
Some of you here, some in the newspaper, some at previous meetings, have stated opposition to the resolution because you admire, respect, and trust the police. That is not what your vote should be based on. The vote is about the plan, not about who put forth the plan. We've discussed the merits of the plan. It's an important discussion, as our <coughs> council president has said, and for the most part, it's been thoughtful and thorough. The, de the police department invited our viewpoints and tweaked the plan in response, both of which I very much appreciate. <coughs> but it has not made the case for surveillance in our downtown. In fact, the case has been made strongly against it. The resolution will bring what I believe is a win-win situation for us all, citizens, our businesses, which need a thriving, inclusive downtown to survive in hard economic times, and our police through improved police community relations. My thanks to the sponsors of the resolution and to everybody engaging in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Katie, you want to speak now or you, um, you want to? Amy comes up. Amy. What's that? Just when Amy comes up. When, so you want to speak with Amy. Got it. Blair, are you, you ready? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Blair and I live at 3 Clark Avenue. Um, I'm first and foremost a person with concrete material needs, such as access to food, shelter, community, and a desire to be a part of my uh, in part of my environment outside of the system of commodification. In addition to that, in addition to many other things that I am that do not create capital, I am a research assistant and graduate <coughs> student at the Labor Center at UMass, and I would personally like to thank uh, our counselors. Uh, Gina Luis Sierra, uh, Bill Dwight, Councillor Labarge, Councillor Klein, Councillor O'Donnell, um, and Councillor Marion, I don't know, Maureen, I don't know your last name. Um, uh, by all of you voting, voting yes to the resolution, you have decided um, that the police chief's most recent proposal for 10 high-res cameras on Main Street is not the right fit for the community of Northampton. Most importantly, you have listened to the voices of the people in your <coughs> words, and you've been able to distinguish the text of the resolution from the politics that surround the issue. You have understand that it's okay to say no to a, a bad idea, even if it's uh, the person who came up with the idea is the police chief. Um, I also imagine you must have researched surveillance and found the mechanisms of surveillance uh, do not sit idle. You've noticed that across the board they expand and expand and expand, that databases get shared and combined, and that those in most needs of services that all humans need get criminalized through this type of surveillance. You've decided that the people of Northampton, the people you represent, deserve better than to be surveilled 24-7. Um, thank you all for listening. Thank you for your support uh, of this resolution, and please support this resolution again tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, Katie. <laughs> I didn't realize there was a three minute long time limit. I had this whole colorful speech where I went on tangents about the happy frog and such, but I'm just gonna go into uh, doing judicious speech editing. that I made in front of the uh, Legislative Matters Committee. Hi, I'm uh, Katie Simon, and I'm here to represent SIFMA Now Western Chapter, Safe Injection Facilities, Massachusetts Now, in our alliance with the people of Northampton against expanded police surveillance. I've lived in Northampton all my adult life, and my activist experience here allows me to see the police's proposal for cameras in downtown as part of a decade-long war in Northampton for public space. With gentrification, some city officials, some of the upper middle class, and some business interests in, on one hand and the poor on the other. From the 2008 anti-panhandling ordinance, which would have de facto criminalized people's First Amendment right to panhandle anywhere, the 2013 removal of benches so homeless people couldn't sleep on them in a city without enough shelter beds, to the Business Improvement District, which attempted to relegate democratically owned public space belonging to people of all classes to a minority of business interests. The people of Northampton opposed these measures en masse and they were all shouted down or fizzled out. The lesson of Northampton's recent past is that we won't stand by while the poor civil rights are abrogated. And make no mistake, the cameras are an anti-poor people measure. 
We're told by Chief Casper that passive surveillance won't unfairly target marginalized people. But when officers look back at footage, who are they likely to identify as criminal accomplices? The poor and homeless people who most often inhabit public spaces. How will a few cultural sensitivity trainings enable officers to overcome race and class biases conditioned into all of us? They didn't in the 2013 Northampton police assault of Jonas Karaya. Even if the NPD uses surveillance technology in the most sensitive matter, once the technology is in place, how can we be assured that succeeding administrations won't use it differently? As a harm reduction activist, I must address the effect that it would have on, the Northampton, on Northampton's illicit substance using poor, who are often used as scapegoats to justify targeting all poor people. While Chief Casper herself claims that cameras don't monitor substance-related crime well, the quote, illegal drug economy, as pro-surveillance <coughs> business owner Jenna Sujat put it in a, ga in a Gazette op-ed, has repeatedly been cited by surveillance supporters as justification for cameras. Sujat and other camera proponents refer to shoplifting, public intoxication, aggressive behavior and violence, severe withdrawal symptoms, overdoses, and deaths as problems accompanying the drug trade. Yet, aggressive behavior and violence aren't, national, uh, aren't natural outgrowths of illicit substance use. Only alcohol has been directly statistically correlated with violence. The drug war creates violence among sellers, but most poor substance users are not violent. Crimes like shoplifting take place because of poverty, whether that poverty is substance related or not. And while middle class, rich, and housed people buy more illicit substances than poor and homeless people, they're not forced to inhabit public space like the poor, so their substance use doesn't automatically make them targets of surveillance. Public intoxication, overdose, withdrawal, and drug-related death are medical problems, <coughs> not policing issues. Nationally, we've concluded that we can't arrest ourselves out of substance use. It's a public health, not a carceral issue. On poor substance users and burden them with criminal records, preventing their participation in the community when the solutions are clear, expansion of voluntary treatment and harm reduction resources. And that means expanding treatment so there aren't huge waiting lists in Western Mass for detox beds and medication assisted treatment programs, and expanding distribution of Narcan to users, and supporting the safe injection facilities that dramatically reduce drug related nuisance complaints, save thousands from overdose, are supported by the police in their areas, and are currently being <coughs> considered by the Massachusetts legislature in Bill S-1081. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Katie, Kate, um, can you, can you, for the record, can state your address? Sure. I live on 97 Locust Street, uh, Holyoke. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, where are we now? Oh, Carolyn Oppenheimer, please. I'm Carolyn Oppenheimer. I live at 3 Montview Avenue. I'm going to make it short because, thank goodness, everybody has spelled it all out and I don't have to elaborate. Um, no cameras, no nukes, and I want to go and I want to go. Um, but I will add one thing. I think that covers those three resolutions. I'm, I'm supporting them in that. In Francis Crowe's resolution, which hasn't been read, there's a point that I really like and wanted to bring up. It says rejoin, our city should rejoin the Mayors for Peace program. Um, I. I know about the Mayor's for Peace program, and I thought we were part of it. I didn't know it had lapsed, but I would be very proud and think it's essential. It reflects who we are to be a city that is mayor, part of the Mayor's for Peace program. And like, there's something else in her resolution, because it's long. Well, that's it. Thank no nukes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jeff Napolitano, please. Uh, my name is Jeff Napolitano. Uh, I live at 26 Burt's Pit Road. Uh, I will make this uh, as brief as possible. Uh, I like no nukes, uh, no cameras, and I want to go when I want to go. That should be like a bumper sticker. Um, <laughs> I just want to say um, I'm here be, um, to thank um, Councilors Bidwell and Dwight and Klein for the work that they did on the resolution regarding militarism, nuclear weapons, and so forth. Um, I think this is actually just the beginning. Um, you're all going to see a, a resolution brought by other residents in Northampton regarding nuclear weapons. Um, unfortunately, this has become a big issue again, and um, this is really just the beginning of the, the work that needs to be done. Um, I will say on the issue of cameras, I mean, aside from the fact that there's, the ev there's no real evidence to support an expenditure um, for, for these things, um, 
Uh, a few years ago, I had a, a conversation with Chief Sinkowitz about fusion centers. Uh, fusion centers are the aggregation of data, digital data by the federal government from local police departments all across the country. Um, and actually, the chief was um, part of the task force that had upgraded all of um, not just Northampton's uh, computer systems, but also many of the Hill Times, Hilltown's computer systems uh, with federal gov government money um, in the the the. Um, quid pro quo was that, uh, in return, the information uh, garnered, uh, gathered by uh, police departments through these new computer systems, through this new communication system, um, are sent to uh, the Fusion Center in um, Maynard, uh, Massachusetts, Boston, and then they go off to, um, to, Bo uh, to DC, to the, the federal government. Uh, and this is not just criminal data. This is not just, you know, arrest records and so forth. This is if, you know, if somebody says that President Dwight is a nuisance and he's drunk and he's on the street and a cop goes and checks it out and he happens to not be, it doesn't matter. That information, all of the information that gets put into this, the, this computer system um, gets aggregated into these fusion centers. I would not be surprised, I don't know the details, but I would not be surprised if, this if the surveillance cameras were um, integrated into the digital system of the police department, that too would end up in the fusion centers and that too would end up in the um, hands of the federal government. Um, and so uh, just a bit of warning about that um, in addition to all of the other concerns that folks have. Um, and thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, well, Sigrid's here again, but I think uh, that was just, yeah. I, I, uh, Mary Finn, please. I saw, there you are. Good evening, I'm Mary Finn. I live at 19 Gleason Road, but I'm here today as a co-owner of a property in Ward 3. I co-own 274 Pleasant Street, which is in a buttered 256 Pleasant Street, as you all know. There's significant construction in that area um, on the corner of Holyoke and Pleasant. And um, I just had a concern. Um, tonight there's a public hearing regarding utility pole uh, movement and construction. And my issue isn't necessarily with that, but um, openness in government and notification. I did receive a notice 48 hours ago, <coughs> a postcard, as in a butter, that there was a public hearing tonight about that development right outside my doorstep. Um, I do think as a city we could probably do better to let people um, have more of a heads up about what's happening. I want to thank Jim Nash, my neighbor in Ward 3, and my counselor uh, for notifying me because he knows I'm curious and, and very invested in the area. So thanks to Jim. But I, I do think as a city we can maybe think about a way um, that people could just know easier uh, what's happening in their neighborhood and in town. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and Dana, you're up. Where'd you go? There you are. All right. <coughs> Hi, I'm Dana Goldblatt. I live at 140 William Street, and I'm here to speak, uh, hopefully for the last time, on the resolution. I wanted to start by thanking everybody who uh, voted in favor of the resolution after I know it was a lot of work listening to all of the things that we all had to say and all of the strong feelings that people had about being watched. and. Uh, I, I wanted to address the feeling that evolved over the course of the, uh, the conversation that, which I think Amy brought up, which is that being anti-surveillance is being anti-police, or that it's specifically being anti-Jody Casper, who everybody likes. And I think that's so much the wrong way to think about the job of a legislature or about the role of police in society. And I just wanted to articulate that for a minute as to why I think that's the wrong thing, because it's going to come up again in the ordinance, and this is really going to matter. That a police department doesn't work well if you just put a nice person in it and then let them do whatever they want. That's a really bad police department, and that's going to go horribly, horribly awry. <laughs> And it also doesn't work well if you just put a really nice person in head of the police department and then ask them, what should we do to run our city? That doesn't work well either. Those are also bad ways to run a city. And that what works really well is what Northampton has, which is a smart and engaged legislature working to figure out what makes sense for our city and passing resolutions and ordinances that articulate that. And a mayor's office 
that executes that plan and that vision. And to have this idea that somehow the plan or the vision should be coming for the po from the police, and that if we don't accept that, just embrace it, whatever it is that comes out of there, that somehow that's anti-police or anti-Northampton or some kind of strange radical behavior is not only contrary to the values of Northampton, but doesn't work very well. That's not, for instance, the way to create a really good thriving business community, because that's not the police expertise. That's not the way to create a really open and engaging public space, because the police, uh, the chief of police is not a city planner. That the places where that kind of wisdom gets aggregated is not the mayor's office or the police department, but here in meetings like this and in groups like this. And I just wanted to, at the risk of being everyone in Northampton just sits around celebrating everyone in Northampton, I wanted to take a moment to sort of celebrate that space because I feel like really something good came out of it and something good is coming out of it right now. And I want to point out to say that this is a good thing that's coming out of it is not to say that the police department is bad, just that that's not their job. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's all I have signed up, but if someone else, uh, Ira, you want to come speak? And then, yep, and you're next. Is this, okay, gotcha. uh, hi, my name is Ira Helfand, 371 Audubon Road in Leeds. Um, I just wanted to speak in support of the resolution on, on military spending. Um, I just came from a, a dinner of the, uh, 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 <coughs> excuse me, the National Priorities Project, in which we talked about the fact that at this point, 64% of the federal discretionary budget is going for military spending. And there's something terribly wrong with our country uh, when there's that kind of disproportionate expenditure at the expense of health care, public education, public housing. It's critically important for all of us to do whatever we can to rearrange those priorities so that more money is actually spent on the needs of our population and less goes into the pockets of defense contractors. <laughs> and while this is a national issue, I think it's enormously important for groups like this, the City Council, to take a stand on that. And I'm very grateful to you for considering this resolution, and I hope that you'll pass it. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're up. Hello. Uh, my name is Chris Kitzmiller. I live at uh, 65 South Street. Um, I've lived in Northampton for almost 17 years now. I own a home here, and uh, I'm here to speak in favor of the resolution against um, against surveillance cameras. Specifically, I'm concerned about um, the way that we've been either deliberately misled or lied to during this process. Um, we were initially told that these cameras were to prevent violent crime. Um, and we were given lots of examples of violent crime in town that has gone unsolved and as a justification for why we need them. Um, and when I expressed my confusion about this point, Chief Casper directly addressed me um, to clarify that the way that the cameras would be installed would be to look not at the public areas where this violent crime has occurred, but only at the streets. Not at sidewalks, not at storefronts, not at the parks, just the streets. Um, and I feel like that's uh, confusing, um, but I'm, I'm no longer confused, I'm just indignant. And uh, it feels like what started out about a lie as to what was being surveilled turned, out into, turned into a lie about why we were surveil surveilling in the first place. Um, additionally, uh, we were told that our surrounding communities already have uh, police-operated surveillance cameras. Um, when it turns out that only Belchertown has only one camera. Um, and that nobody remembers how that got into service in the first place. Um, uh, East Hampton has some city-run cameras that occupied a space that wasn't particularly important before they built the boardwalk, but once they did, they put up a sign saying that you're on camera. Um, but, that, but again, that's not, those aren't police cameras that they have up there. Um, also, we've been continually shown how the Boston Marathon bombing is a great example of why we need surveillance cameras. Um, and so, uh, one, we're not Boston. Um, 
the Boston Marathon is a, an event that is many orders of magnitude um, bigger than whatever we do here. Uh, but also that footage that was disseminated by the FBI to help identify the brothers were was private security footage. It was not temporary footage for the event. It was not police surveillance cameras. It was private footage from a restaurant. Uh, and that's a lie about how we're being surveilled. Um, and these lies mirror lies on the federal level about the way they're surveilling us. And this ordinance or this resolution is important to stand up against this misrepresentation about surveillance in our society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, before I start, I'd like to introduce everyone to Laura Crutzler, who is the new administrative assistant for the city of Northampton and my personal godsend. Um, Laura, would you please call the roll? Here. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor Navarro. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. Councilor Donald. Here. Councilor Shera. Here. Okay. We have a quorum. So first up, our first item is uh, uh, what uh, Ms. Finn was referring to as item 17.408. This is a national grid poll petition for Holyoke Street. This is in accordance with the provision <coughs> of uh, uh, Massachusetts General Law Section 22, Chapter 166 of the General Law. The public hearing will be held on the petition of a national grid to erect poles and wires on, along, under, or across one or more public ways. Moved to open public hearing. Second. Second. Okay. Motions have made and seconded to open the public hearing. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. So Lisa's here. Lisa will speak on behalf of the proponents. Good evening, members of the council. Lisa Jasinski, I'm here for National Grid. We're <coughs> looking for permission to relocate a pole on Holyoke Street. It's approximately 38 feet, I think it was, west of the existing location. And it's simply to relocate the power lines so they're away from the new building that's going to be going up, the CDC building at 256 Pleasant Street, like Mary was speaking about. Um, it's just we need clearance and then uh, extra clearance from when scaffolding is around building, erecting the building. So we're going to have to move the pole out of the way to do that. <coughs> Go ahead. Council of Barge? Yes. Um, hearing from a resident yep. who's an owner mm -hmm. of getting a notice within 48 hours, which I feel also is not fair, could you explain why 48 hours of a notice? Um, well, I might be, ab be able to explain that at my next meeting better because I actually got notified the beginning of the week. It's a process when we have to relocate it. Um, I, think, I think what happens is uh, it, it seems like it should go out sooner because the, the announcement happened two weeks ago. So if I think, though, when it's announced that it's going to take place, I think notification goes back to our department, and then she sends out these these things so there's it, it's kind of crossing so two weeks ago I don't know when exactly she's notified the woman in our company actually gets notice that this is going to be the date so then she can fill out the cards or whomever fills out the cards and sends them out I might be able to find out that little that little piece of it better for next time Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's worth noting that in the past I know that people have gotten uh, more timely announcements mm -hmm. and this is maybe an anomaly it's not the it's not the regular, so it, it, to, to the extent of my limited knowledge, but that's been my experience. Right. Yeah, I thought so. I thought so too, but mm -hmm. I'll find out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so now in the public hearing, it's an opportunity for the uh, opponents or people who simply have questions relative to this uh, petition to speak. Mary, or did you? And, and I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to identify yourself and announce your address. Mary Fenn, 19 Gleason Road. Lisa and I met just yesterday, I guess, right? Um, and she explained that that pole will be moving and then moving back. Um, it will be in front of our property for some time, and I don't have any qualms about that. Um, I think it's reasonable and fine. Uh, what I do have continued issues with is when people are doing work on Holyoke Street, um, they often park right in front of the entryway to my business. 
Um, it looks like there's not a lot going on on Folioke Street, but a couple of us are still running our businesses on that corner. Um, so I'd ask Lisa to be careful with my tree, <laughs> my sign, and keeping the entryway to my business open <coughs> during the process. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this issue? I'll accept a motion to close the public hearing. Make a motion. Second. Okay, motion's made and seconded. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. I see. Now, uh, recognition one minute announcements by councilors. Councilors? Nothing, Councilor Klein? Um, I wanted to let people know it's a little bit early, and I'll probably remind you at our next meeting as well, um, or maybe the first one in December, on uh, Human Rights Day, which is December 10th. It's a Sunday at 2 p.m. on the steps of City Hall. The Human Rights Commission will be sponsoring a kickoff for um, what was called the Civility Pledge that we've heard about. Um, we signed on to a resolution, in fact, that the Human Rights Commission created around it. It's now being called um, the Pledge for Dignity, I think. We changed the concept from civility to dignity. Um, and the public is invited, and of course, all city councilors are invited. So. December 10th at 2 p.m. on the steps of City Hall, and the keynote speaker will be the mayor. Okay. Uh, the, we've now come to the point where the mayor would have an opportunity to offer proclamations, but he's not here to do that, so we move on to the resolutions. Um, first up, we have item 17.396. This is a resolution opposing the installation of municipally operated surveillance technology downtown. It's a second reading. Is there a motion? Move approval. Motion's made and seconded. It's put on the floor. Is there any further discussion on this? No? I, um, again, I, I just want to um, appreciate the, the discussion and actually echo Amy's remarks and Dana's as well, uh, and, and Blair's as well. The, uh, the discussion in and of itself was was and is value, uh, valuable and it will continue to be so but it also reaffirmed my faith in the, in the productive side of democracy I think you have the wrong resolution we're talking about okay. well you skipped over their a the militarism yes. resolution yeah, the is first is first one you went to b i have a different agenda i have, I have a hidden <laughs> agenda okay. <laughs> <laughs> out of the bag Damn. All right, let's see what's going on. Back to the number two, maybe. Of the He's testing you. If you pass the test, well done. This stuff. Go to this stuff, the paper stuff. All right, so so all my pithy comments will... <laughs> well, actually, we'll continue with this resolution because it's actually been put on the floor and already um, seconded and stuff. So I'll give Laura a chance to catch up and... and uh, <coughs> I'll, you're okay? Councilor O'Donnell made the motion to, uh, uh, to put it on the floor, and Councilor Klein, I think, seconded? You didn't second? Councilor Barge, I believe. Councilor Barge seconded, okay. So, and, so anyway, thanks anyway. So, so now I just showed you the rougher side of uh, the sausage making. This one. The presiding <laughs> officer doesn't know what the hell yes. he's doing. So, um, cameras. Yeah, okay. That's it. So the resolution has not been amended or changed. There's been no changes to it. So uh, any other discussion on this beyond my blathering? No? Okay. Um, what's the preference here? Roll call? Roll call. Roll call? Okay, roll call, please. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. 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 No. Okay. The resolution passes seven two, and that's that's the final reading on that resolution. Now we move to the resolution that was properly placed at this point, and. 
time to actually do we have we should have the text for that. <coughs> This one, there's a paperwork. Which one are we jumping to? And this one is item 17.415. This is a resolution calling upon Congress to allocate resources from the military. Um, and then, and yeah. this is upon the recommendation of Councilors Bidwell, White, and Klein. And whereas President Trump has proposed to move $54 billion from spending on social services, education, and environmental programs at home and abroad to military spending, bringing military spending to well over 60 percent of federal discretionary spending. And whereas polling has found the U.S. public to favor a $41 billion reduction in military spending, representing a $95 billion less in military spending than what has been proposed by uh, President Trump. And whereas the nuclear modernization, modernization program, also known as the Trillion Dollar Triad, will cost taxpayers over one trillion dollars in the next several decades to create a more powerful and destructive nuclear uh, to, to create more powerful and destructive nuclear weaponry thus violating the treaty on non-proliferation of nuclear weapons to which the united states is a signatory and whereas one way to alleviate the refugee crisis would be ending not escalating wars that create refugees and whereas President Trump has admitted that the enormous military spending of the past 16 years has been disastrous and made us less safe, not safer. And whereas fractions of the proposed military budget could provide free, top quality education from preschool through college, end hunger and starvation on Earth, convert the U.S. to clean energy, provide clean water everywhere it is needed on the planet, build fast trains between all U.S. cities, and double non-military U.S. foreign aid rather than cutting it. And whereas 121 retired U.S. generals have written a letter opposing, the cutting, uh, opposing cutting foreign aid, and whereas a December 2014 Gallup poll of 65 nations found that the United States was far and away the country considered the largest threat to peace in the world, and whereas a United States responsible for providing clean drinking water, schools, medicine, and solar panels to others would be more secure <coughs> and hostility around the world. And whereas our environmental and human needs are desperate and urgent and opposing military spending is the single most sustainable action we can take. And whereas the military is greatest consumer of petroleum in the United States. Oops, right. Oh. And whereas economic, uh, economists of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst have documented that military spending is an economic drain rather than jobs, a jobs program. Mm -hmm. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, urges the United States Congress to move our tax dollars in exactly the opposite direction proposed by the President, from militarism to human and environmental needs. Be it further resolved that the City of Northampton restates its membership in the Cities of Peace for Peace program that strives to raise international public awareness regarding the need to abolish nuclear weapons and includes 7,417 cities across the world. And be it further resolved that the City Council of Northampton calls on Congress to appropriate no further funding for the development or, or production of new, nu of new nuclear weapons. And be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution will be forwarded to U.S. Congressman James McGovern, U.S. Senator Edward J. Markey, U.S. Senator uh, uh, Elizabeth A. Warren. Uh, and that's it, yes. And uh, worth noting, and when we get into the discussion, actually, the we are members of uh, mayors of the cities. We are cities. still currently, yeah. Um, so I'll accept a motion to put this on the Make floor. a motion. Second. Okay. Uh, Councilor Bidwell, Councilor Klein, you want to speak to Councilor Bidwell? I'd, 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 be, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, when I was approached by Francis Crow and Jeff Napolitano to, to join them in working on this and to sponsor it, I was, I was very pleased to do so for, for two reasons. Mainly one is Francis herself. Um, though uh, she made it clear she wanted nothing to do with any more proclamations or fanfare, just the resolution itself, please. Um, I can't let it go without, uh, without comment that um, uh, Francis has uh, been a peace activist literally since, uh, I guess you could say she was politicized, radicalized by the bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 and has stayed on course as a peace activist ever since. 
Uh, she founded AFSC Western Mass Chapter herself and counseled over 2,000 young men considering their options for the Vietnam War, many of whom became conscientious objectors. I relate to that a great deal because I wasn't one of those 2,000 young men in Francis's basement, but I was in another basement and got the same counseling. Um, she, one could go on and on, but she's obviously a force in the movement to fight nuclear power and to fight additional nuclear weapons. Um, I think we could agree that she's the moral compass for the Valley's progressive community and is, helps us all to be sure we stay on course. Um, but about the resolution itself, uh, Ira Helfand mentioned that he was at a, an event earlier, a National Priorities Project event. I was there too. And there was a report that NPP has worked on that was issued that, that did say that, that they came out with their definition of a militarized budget, not just the military spending and the spending on wars, the various ways they're described and accounted for, but when you, when you add in, uh, in incarceration and, and border patrol and other, other factions, you do get to fully 64% <coughs> of the discretionary federal budget spent on, on the so-called militarized functions. Uh, and we know what that comes at the expense of. So I'm proud to, to be one of the sponsors of a resolution that puts us on record as advocating for a very different way of defining our national priorities and a very different way of spending our money. Hand, but I'm happy. I know. Well, I, I always <laughs> <defer> <laughs> first, so it's yeah. Um, I, I don't have a lot to say because I think this um, this is a resolution that speaks for itself, extraordinarily articulately, um, and I'm very appreciative to Frances Crow for all that she's done over the years, um, but for this resolution tonight, and also for uh, Jeff Napolitano's work on it, um, we're very lucky to have had him with um, AFSC Western Mass and now with the Resistance Center. Um, people, I don't know if people have had a chance to look at this, but the citations here are just remarkable. There's a lot of research that went into this. Um, and what's remarkable is just how I hate this phrase, but this is an absolute no-brainer to me because when you look at um, what the federal budget is going to with um, militarization and you look at, this just lays out how um, every human need could be satisfied if we just um, did not fund militarization. It's just, it, it's so very clear that it's something um, that we need to do. So, of course, um, I encourage everyone to vote yes on this, and I think we really need to move forward in working towards this in proactive ways. And I would speak to this on, for parochial context. If Northampton invested 60 plus percent of its budget in police. I, what would that make us? What would that turn us into? It, it just runs counter to everything, our ethos. What we invest 60 plus percent of our budget into is our schools, is into education. Um, I'm saying that by way of bragging, by saying that I would like us to be held up as possibly a, a, a model for President Trump, but I doubt that's going to happen. I'm not particularly, I'm not optimistic about that prospect. But the fact is, is that we're not unique in that respect. Virtually every community in the state of Massachusetts and, and virtually every other community in the country subsidizes their schools in the majority. Their emergency services, or if you can call it that, or our, our marshal systems do not get that proportion of our budget. And that's because budgets, as I've said, our moral documents, it expresses the desire of the communities that it's supposedly subsidizing. This is completely turned upside down when you start speaking on the federal level and even the global level. We are disproportionately invested in military, vastly outstripping every other country. <coughs> At this point, the, the military industrial uh, complex that uh, Dwight Eisenhower warned us about and that Reverend Caicos referred to, has act, the, the, his greatest dread has been realized and surpassed. 
we've we've accommodated this slow boil of off this frog, if you will, that we've we've made we've come to terms with it, which is really startling and terrifying to think of. It does not mean diminish our ability to defend ourselves. <coughs> We're not talking about defending ourselves in these circumstances. These are all systems that are actually designed to be aggressive and to be dominant. And that has no corollary in democracy, as far as I can tell. So um, I am also grateful for Francis I, as a proposal here. I would like to point out that Francis, in my tenure as a counselor, has uh, delivered similar uh, resolutions to us in the past that have all passed. Mm -hmm. um, I know three that are specifically relative to the military budget. And this has been, we now can call it a litany or a plea, an ongoing litany. <coughs> and in the, in the desperate hope that it will be heard and understood and that we will, and I think uh, supporting this resolution reaffirms our commitment to this process and this hope and this aspiration. So I hope I join the other sponsors in expressing my hope that you'll be able to join us in, in voting in support of this. Uh, Councilor Labarge. Yes, and I want to echo what Council President Dwight just said about um, Francis Crow. I've been out there with her holding signs. She was very supportive with Ward 6 on closing of the landfill and saving the Barnes Aquifer. And thank you, Francis, for everything that you have done in our city of Northampton. Um, on this resolution, I, I do not agree with what President Trump is proposing to move the $54 million from spending on social services, education, and environmental programs at home and abroad to military spending. We are looking at over 60% of federal discretionary spending. That's a lot. I feel that the president is double talking about when he has admitted that the enormous military spending of the past 16 years has been disastrous and made us less safe and not safer. I have a problem with that language. And he wants to move 54 million and cut many valuable services to human and environmental needs. There are so many children and families who are starving on earth. We have many seniors who need all the support they can get to be able to have a better life and a good quality of life. Our human needs are desperate. I find this move that the president has proposed a threat to peace in the world, not war. I don't believe in war. I believe in peace in this world. And I know I have heard Frances Crow state that many, many times of me knowing her for over 24 years of peace, not war. Thank you very much. Um, Anyone else on this topic? Um, I would like to propose a slight amendment, changing the language, pointing out the fact that we, the Northampton still is an active participant in Mayor's for, uh, mm -hmm. Cities for Peace and Mayor's for Peace. Um, I'd mean, like to get props where we earned them. So, I'd, and I'd, <laughs> so, and I missed that on the first um, on my reads on this. So, um, let me see what would that look like. Um, uh, Reaffirms our membership. Yeah, I'll accept that. Yeah, do you want to? Where Where is Northampton? It says restates, which isn't inappropriate. But right. I mean, you could say something like it doesn't say reinstate. I think that's where it was confused. Right, 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 right. right. Um, let's see. Turn it. Okay. By the way, I have the correct agenda now and the correct document, so whew. Um, okay. All right, so um, I like reaffirm. I think reaffirm is actually pretty easy. 
because I know the mayor is that rather emphatic about this. So he's he's, he's and rightfully proud of this uh, distinction. So the city of Northampton reaffirms its its membership in the city's uh, for peace program. Would be the amended language. Is is there a second on the amendment? Second. Your Honor. Is it mayors for peace or cities for peace? That's what it's I mayors for peace. Yeah. I, I belong to Mayors for Peace. Yeah. Mayors. They get all their Mayors emails and get all. It is Mayors for Peace. I just forwarded you one I got the other day. So yeah, no, I got that. I got that. I've <laughs> signed on to resolutions and yeah, I. It's Mayors for Peace. Okay, so I. This is the first I heard that I wasn't a member. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so I would not, not be a member, Frank. How about this? Sure. City, uh, so this would be the amended language. The city of Northampton reaffirms its membership in Mayors for Peace, in the Mayors for Peace program. So it's changing cities to mayors mm -hmm. and reaffirm, restate the term restates to, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, and did I get a second on that? Second. Okay. Any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, back to the order. Uh, any other discussion? Council Klein. I wanted to just, um, uh, propose an amendment that we add uh, that this be sent to the President of the United States as well. Well, there's something that's going to sit in an inbox for a while. So, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe the Council President could deliver this one too. <laughs> I'll second that one. Okay, that's second. Okay, um, so that would be the last resolve that um, we would include President Donald J. Trump. Is there a second on the amendment? Second. Councilor Klein? Okay. Uh, any discussion on that amendment? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Now, <coughs> any other discussion or amendments? Uh, voice vote, roll call. What's the pleasure? Roll call. Roll call. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. 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 All right. That passes in first reading. And thank you very much, Francis. Uh, now we're back on the regular regular schedule here. This is a resolution regarding End of Life Options Act. This is second reading. Is there a motion? Motion. Second. Motions made by Councilor Labarge and seconded by Councilor Bidwell. Further discussion on this? Personally, I would like to move this as fast as we can because I don't think I can emotionally bear any more testimony, <laughs> to be honest. This is, uh, but, uh, Council LaBarge. Council Bidwell had his hand up first. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Bidwell. Um, no, no, no testimony. Uh, just, uh, no emotional testimony. Just, just uh, a brief comment that I agree with several of the comments we heard about it. It really has been an excellent conversation. I've, I've, I've learned a lot talk with folks about things I never would have imagined talking to them about and I think collectively it's been <coughs> a, a very good process and I um, you know thank John Berkowitz and the other sponsors just regardless of the resolution just for just for, for promoting such a wonderful conversation an important conversation um, with regard to the, the the reservations that we have heard uh, tonight I, I must say that I've, I've considered all those uh, I take great comfort in uh, the fact that there is no evidence from Oregon or the other states, as best I can tell, of, uh, of abuse. I, I, I respect a great deal the, the input and hear the concerns, uh, but I remain satisfied that the legislation before uh, our state legislature does, in, in fact, have, uh, have adequate uh, safeguards in it, so I continue to be supportive of what I, I think it is appropriately called uh, uh, the End of Life Options Act. I, I, I'm not very partial to calling it instead physician-assisted suicide. I don't think it's, it's really fair or accurate to label it that. I, I do like thinking of it as the End of Life Options Act. I think that's what it's all about. And now Council LaBarge. Um, I want to thank everybody who came in tonight to speak. Also, Chris Palamas, I respect you, but I have a hard time with what I've been told about 
your version of it that you have recorded. Um, I think what really hit me tonight was the young woman who spoke about her father, which is almost similar to what I went through with my dad for three months. But we didn't have that choice. I think another hard thing in my life was holding a little six-year-old boy in Dana-Farber who had cancer and did not have a very long life. And he gave me this look with his eyes that I'll never forget the rest of my life. And he didn't have an option either. I wanna thank everybody who came forth about making their choice, the right choice, your civil rights of how you would like to die. And it's time for it to happen. We have State Rep Peter Cocott, who's our representative. He wouldn't be doing something like this and our other reps are senators. This is something that needs to be done. And let that person make that choice of how they wanna die. We've been through it with our families and it's not easy. It's just not easy to see a loved one just suffer and not be able to say, I wanna die. Let me go in peace. So I wanna thank everybody tonight who have really come up and talked about things in their heart that has affected them with their lives or a disease that they might have in their families. I am supporting this 100%. Anyone else? Um, actually, I wanna to refer to uh, Chris Palamas' remarks as well, and actually, um, they're well received. Life with dignity actually is, uh, you know, <laughs> we. Actually, this is what we struggle with on a daily basis, lives with dignity, which we fail at miserably in large part. And I, my only issue here with, it, with your remarks is that I don't hold them mutually exclusive. They should not be held mutually exclusive. One should not come at the expense of others, of the other. Uh, uh, an opportunity to, di to die on your own terms will be your last choice, and it should be your choice. At the same time, where the struggle is to try to live with dignity is so much harder because it requires so much from a community and from other individuals and from yourself indeed. And that is a bigger struggle in the end. It is the struggle that supposedly we're all, we, we deal with on a regular basis, at least those of us who are conscientious enough to. So, um, I'll spare you all my personal stories relative to this, but needless to say, I have experienced them, and we all have, because we walk, we are mortal, and everyone we love and cherish is also mortal, and that will end. And how that ends, uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to f uh, at least allow people the opportunity to choose what that looks like and how that is and how that's manifested. And so it, it is my profound hope that actually this resolution really does, in some small way, influence the decision of the legislators to actually finally enact a law that at least allows us that one final proper appropriate choice. Anyone else? Okay. Again, this is a resolution, so it could be voice vote or would you like a roll call? Roll call. Okay. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Yes. Yes. Councillor Yes. Yes. That passes in second reading. Thank you very much. Um, another resolution. Here we go, Sam. Item 17.412, this is a resolution in support of bills, uh, the Senate Bill 2100 and House Bill 1900. This is concerning the safety of school children embarking and disembarking in school buses as second reading. 
Is there a motion to put Move it on? To the approve the motion. Okay, motion's made and seconded. Further discussion on this item? Thank you, Sam, for your good work. Thank you, Councilor Sherrick. Thank you, Councilor O'Donnell, all the, for, for all your support and work on these things. So I appreciate it. Um, roll call or? Roll call. Councilor LaBarge would like a roll call. <laughs> Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor yes. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 That passes in second reading. Thank you. Blessedly, there are no presentations, and in fact, actually, the consent agenda is rather small as well. We have just two items on that, and that's uh, the first one is to uh, 17 item 17.408, and that's to approve the poll petition from National Grid for Holyoke Street. Also, is item 17.418, that's an appointment to the Arts Council. This is to refer to uh, the Committee on City Services, that's uh, for the Arts Council. <coughs> Jonah Zuckerman of 82 Jackson Street, Northampton, the term to start October 2017, expiring June 2020. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay. Motions and made and seconded. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We'll have uh, the minutes from our last meeting available at our next meeting. So. Now we recess for. Questions? Oh, yes. Might the chair consider a one-minute recess as we have a number of sure. folks departing yeah. and someone no, would like uh, to uh, say, say goodbye to I'm some gonna, of our I'm guests gonna, here? I'm going to save, I'm going to be expansive and say five and a half minutes. Wow. <laughs> wow. Recess. How long do we have? Um, would you like five minutes. To five and a half. Five and a half? <laughs> yeah, at least you came up with like, like a... Oh, thank you. Yeah, 30 you know, minutes. Five. Five. <laughs>
Okay, we're coming out of recess. And oddly enough, now that we've come out of recess, we're going into recess, this time for the Finance Committee, where Councilor Murphy will take over from here. Thank you, Laura. Would you call the roll of finance, please? Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Finance. Present. Councilor Gavari. Present. Present. Councilor here. Excellent. Uh, first order is to approve the minutes of October 19th, 2017. Do we have a motion? Make a motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Um, we have a financial order, 17.416, in order to authorize intermunicipal agreements with surrounding communities for document management services. It's upon the recommendation of the mayor, whereas Master General Law 40, um, Section 4A allows for joint operation of public activities among governmental units, and whereas Mass General Law Section 40, Section 4A requires that such intergovernmental agreements be approved in a city by the council and the mayor, and whereas the city of Northampton provides services to and shares services with other municipalities. Therefore, pursuant to Mass General Law 40, Section 4A, the City Council hereby authorizes the city of Northampton to enter into an intermunicipal agreement to provide Laserfish document management services to the towns of Williamsburg, Southampton, Goshen, West Hampton, and Chesterfield. We have a motion in finance. Second. Second. And the mayor's here to talk about it. Um, I think as a, as a good measure of how far our IT uh, department has come, uh, this is a great example. Um, Antonio Pagan has been working with uh, Mass IT, uh, which is the state's IT agency. And these um, five communities uh, in the hill towns um, were awarded a regional community <coughs> compact. They signed a community compact with the lieutenant governor, and part of it involved receiving some grant funding to help them um, build out their own IT capacity. So this is actually a project that uh, we will be doing with those towns. We already have laser fish, so if you go on to our planning uh, file, uh, folder or you know file cabinet as they call it um, it's where we store all of our documents uh, in the laser fiche system so we would basically be hosting a separate system for these five towns and providing the services they don't have the you know they don't have the networking and they don't have the um, the capacity that that uh, we have but they definitely have the document storage needs so so this is a partnership where we'll be providing that it'll be completely separate from our um, system. There won't be inter any intermingling. It'll be protected from our system, and we'll obviously be reimbursed um, as part of the process. So, um, so this just allows us to enter into an, an intermunicipal agreement with these uh, other communities. So it's another example of our uh, working as a good uh, regional partner and uh, and sharing uh, sharing services as we do with so many other uh, municipal functions. Questions for the mayor and finance. Hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. And the, the only other item in finance on the agenda is uh, the finance director giving us our first quarter financial report. Good evening. Um, there's not a whole lot to report on this. With only three months, it's hard to really see if there are any trends. Uh, but in general, revenue is definitely on track for the general fund. That's the first report that I gave you. There are two um, line items that I'd like to highlight though. The ho hotel motel tax, the first quarter that we received for 2018 is 5% or $10,900 above the first quarter of last year, which is good news. And then for the meals tax, uh, the first quarter of 2018 is $20,000 over the first quarter of 2017. So those are both um, things that are really good to, to note, and that is good news. But in general, the rest of the revenues um, for the general fund are pretty much right where we would expect. Again, it's kind of early um, in the year with only three months. Um, for the expenditures in the general fund, again, there really are no areas of concern at this point. Everything seems to be tracking pretty much the way we would have thought. Um, the revenues and expenditures for the enterprise funds uh, are similar. There's really um, all of the um, enterprise funds have brought in about 25% of the revenue, which is what we would expect. Utility billing is done you know, continuously throughout the year. So 
Um, that looks pretty much on track. And again, in the expenditure portion, you know, the salary line items look on track and the OM line items, it's hard to look at the percentages because sometimes we might, in the OM budget, we might be paying for a lot of things right up front at the beginning of the fiscal year. So it might show some lines, you know, fully expended and then, you know, so it's, at, Three months, it's just really hard to really see any trends. But I see nothing that's a concern, nothing that's alarming. And I do think the fact that the hotel, motel, and meals are up significantly from the quarter, same quarter last year, is, is a good sign. Any questions for Susan? Councillor Nash. Um, so, the, so, so two questions. First of all, uh, and it, it's more a general question, but it, it does relate to this which is we, we now have the, um, the card system for paying for parking downtown and that I know we pay a fee when people use that system. Has that affected our, our park, the revenues we, we make from parking either in the garage or on, with the on-street parking downtown? We've had the system in the garage for about two years and about 6% six, 6 of revenues go towards the credit card fees. It's under $20,000. Um, for the for the on street on street and parking lots, we have yet I have yet to really delve into okay. analyzing that, but I will be hoping to include that in a future report. All right, that'd be great. The, the other question is, and and I noticed here was that the police department parking garage, that particular garage, we we don't seem to generate much re revenue from that. It's only available to the public nights and weekends. Mm -hmm. um, it is somewhat hard to find, and I think the mayor and I were speaking about this earlier this evening. The wayfinding project will be helping to direct people to that right. to that Best location. Parking. It's like it's it's amazing to me. I go to a, cal a show at the Calvin, and there's like no cars there, and it's like parking right nearby. So we're trying to do a better job of telling people where it is with right. wayfinding signs. It's on our all of our parking maps. I just don't think people think of it as an option. Right. That after six o'clock, right. you know, you have to pay, but it's like covered parking, really yeah. close to downtown. So we have to spread the word. Right. Yeah. And that and that line that you referred to in your email about a thousand dollars. That's what I budgeted last year. We right. brought and in about eight hundred dollars for that garage. So, um, so as you can see, it's right. it's underutilized. Thank you, Councilor Labarge. Did you have a question? Um, I want to thank you, Susan, and the mayor. Transparency in coming forth and talking about the budget. Good. Well, we, I will be here every quarter after every quarter with these financials. So, and I'm sure as we get more into the year, the, there'll be more meetings. There'll be more to There's talk more about. There's more statistics. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, there is no business that's new that I know of. So a motion to Make a adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. So we come out of the second recess and back into the regular order. And we first up, we have item 17.416, and that's an order to authorize a municipal agreement with surrounding communities for document management services. Move to approve. Okay, we've got three motions to approve. We're going to take O'Donnell for the motion and uh, Council Murphy for the second. Uh, I'm sorry, Council Klein, we'll get you next time. <laughs> uh, any further discussion on this? Uh, roll call, please. Uh, Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor yes. 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 All right, that passes in first reading. Uh, next up, we have a second reading for item 17.411. That's an order to authorize payment of a prior year bill. Move to approve. Okay, motions made by Councilor O'Donnell, seconded by Councilor Labarge. Uh, any further discussion on this item? Roll call, please, Laura. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shearer. Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Okay, that passes in second reading. Now, also in second reading, this is the item 17. We're in, un, in orders now, item 17.410. This is the order regarding tax classification for FY 2018. 
Is there a motion? Approve. Second. Motion's made and second. Seconded by Councilor O'Donnell and Councilor Klein. No, it was Councilor Labarge. Sorry. I just. <laughs> it's that time of the night. I was just, yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> any further discussion on <laughs> this item? Laura, roll call. Yes. 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 All right. That passes in second reading. Next up, uh, under ordinances, item 17.417. This is an ordinance regarding departmental revolving funds. This is to refer to Committee on Finance and uh, the Committee on Legislative Matters. This is Move to refer. Second. Second. Okay, Council Sheriff. Yep. Okay, so uh, Council Sheriff seconded. Council Labarge moved it. Council Bidwell tried. <laughs> Not fast <laughs> enough. Not quick enough. Would it be possible to get a brief description of what we're referring? Yeah. I mean, so you want, actually, I don't you want you to read it. You don't want me to read it? No, thank you. Well, uh, Your Honor, you want to give a br can you give a thumbnail sketch of this? Sure. It's it's our favorite municipal modernization act again which basically said that you have to, we used to put all these in orders every year, uh, which we obviously still have to do, so I'm not really sure why it's modernization, but they want the revolving funds in the ordinance book. Yeah. They want them to be in the code of ordinance. So it doesn't replace the ordinance, it's just the orders with the additional staff. Yes, they want it to be, you know, we come to you to authorize the creation of these funds, they want them to be created in the ordinance. And so we're basically going to have you just, and this is a model language, then so we're just going to have you memorialize it in the ordinance book. So anytime, of course, anytime we want to change a revolving fund, that means we'll have to file an ordinance change. Mm -hmm. but, we, but as we still have to every year submit all the orders with a list of them all. So that doesn't not really sure how it <laughs> saves anything or whatever. Just uh, belt and suspenders. I suppose. Yeah. 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 So that's what that's all. That's what Thank this you. is all about. So, um, and I think. The, Finance director can send you the model. Or we just basically follow the, the model ordinance, and then the rest of it's the same table you've always seen every year in the budget with the various uh, funds. So, yeah. Thanks. Any other discussion on the referral? Voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. I'm going to spare you. I have no updates, um, and there's no information requests. I'm pretty sure there's no new business. So Move to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Councilor Klein to adjourn. <laughs> second. And then Councilor LaBarge like to second. I like the statistics. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you all very much.